Greetings, Questa. The Meddlesome Meeples present Tome Talk with Matt and Richard. Welcome to Tome Talk, and this week Matt is going to tell us about a book which, well, at first he's going to actually have to tell us what it is, <laughs> um, because I don't know what he's done to it, but it doesn't have a front cover. Like, yeah. For those of you that are, are listening rather than watching, uh, this is a, a very, well, you could call it a very well-loved book or a very yes. well-hated book. Yes, depending. well, I uh, took very good care of my book collection for many, many years, mm-hmm. uh, and then I had children. And right. W- this one was on the side, and my young youngest child happened to come across it, and he thought it looked nice, he thought it looked mm. interesting, and in doing so, it, the uh, front and back of the book have been torn off. It doesn't actually affect the story. This I've still got everything for the story. I've still I'm got all the introductory take the story out. <laughs> bits. Uh, yeah. Um, Change the ending. <laughs> there's still several pages left before you get to the story. It's just the literally the cover page and the, yeah. the back page are gone. It starts with a list of characters, doesn't it? It, it <laughs> does, yeah. Uh, but this is book is actually the Dragons of Autumn Twilight. Okay. Now this is the first book of the Dragonlance Chronicles, which uh, some of our viewers and listeners may have heard of. Uh, this is by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Okay. Um, two people. Two people, yeah. Two authors. And they wrote all of the uh, Dragonlance books together. Mm, right. And this is actually quite interesting because this is it was published by Wizards of the Coast originally. It was right. from 1984. Mm-hmm. Now, Wizards of the Coast, for some of our gaming audience, will know that um, they were the pu- they're the people behind D&D. Right, okay. Okay, yeah. so, and that really does tell you a lot of what you need to know about this well, book. Well, yeah, um, actually, the logo looks similar to D&D. Yeah. That I can see. And there is actually a Dragonlance board game as well. I don't know if you've noticed, but Richard can see up on that corner of the room, there is a Dragonlance board game. Yes, that looks quite old. And it's, um, if you actually, it's kind of like the forerunner of the D&D Attack Wing. Right, that oh. kind of aerial dragon combat, but going off off topic now, bringing it back to the um, the book story. This is a book that I would say, if you are a, a fan of fantasy mm-hmm. and you are of a certain age, you will probably have picked up and read at some point in your life. Okay. If you are younger than a certain age, you probably wouldn't have done. So are you younger I than am, the age? Or? I am of the age group that I think would have picked oh. this up and read it and because of when it came out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think that this is a book that if you are a D&D player or a role player, you'll probably jump, you would have jumped on very much in when it first came out because um, the actual story itself is based on a D&D session that the authors played. Right. <laughs> oh, okay, so basically you play a game of D&D and then you write down what happened yeah. in, a, in a proper prose way. Yeah. And actually, funnily enough, um, a friend of mine, uh, Ryan, when we were playing role-playing games when we were younger, he actually did write some stories based on some of our role-play sessions hmm. and they were quite hilarious. That's a good idea. Um, and I, th- I don't think he's even got them anything more. I think they're on an old hard drive somewhere. Mm-hmm. But um, as we say, this was based on a D&D session played by the authors and... It does very much feel when you're reading it like um, watching a role play group uh, because you've got a, the story, you've got the characters in this book are like almost cliched now within fantasy and within D and D squads because you've when got when it's an old book it's like that in text yeah the stereotypes start somewhere <laughs> yeah and uh, the people that make up the uh, party in this game mm-hmm. you've got Tannis Tannis Halfalvan. Now, he's quite an interesting character in the sense that he's caught between two worlds because his mother uh, was Elven. Mm -hmm. His father was a human warrior. He doesn't know who he is. He just knows that during a war between the Elves and the humans that his mother was raped by a human warrior. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he he does kind of hate the human side of him because of that. Mm -hmm. But also, um, because Elves are generally distrusted, he grows a beard so that he can sort of pass off as human as he travels around. Okay. So he's got quite an interesting mixed heritage and he's, he kind of tries to ad- adhere more to the elven side of him. Mm-hmm. But in the same time, he's in love with both an elvish woman, Lorana, uh, and a human swordswoman, Kitiara. Right. And that 
again is quite you know symbolic of that inner struggle between those two uh, halves of himself the so elvish half yeah. and the human half so he learns not to tar all humans with the same brush yeah and he does have human friends that he's, he's yeah. close to he just hates that uh, part of himself because growing up amongst the elves he was uh, basically treated by the elves as if he was a human right. uh, and so he wasn't trusted he wasn't really one of them mm-hmm. but then at the same time he's caught between two worlds because when humans see the ears they just see the elf Spock. They yeah, they don't see the human part of him, so he's kind mm. of an outcast in in two worlds because of his heritage. Because like, cause like Spock's half human, but because he's the only Vulcan, I mean, we seem very <laughs> Vulcan to everyone. Yeah. Else. <laughs> so that's quite an interesting, makes for quite an interesting part of a character, but it's mm. very much um, like the typical trope of the stoic uh, leader. Uh, mm-hmm. But he's got this inner struggle. It's kind of like a uh, Aragon, if you, if in a way. Right. But it's kind of like a dumbed down version of Aragon. Mm. Um, but he, it's it makes so, for an interesting. <laughs> character. Aragon was more nuanced, but he was like done from Ara- decades before. <laughs> <laughs> A- Aragon was written, you know, as a much more nuanced character. I, I felt. But other members of the party, Stern Brightblade, Stern Brightblade. Now he was a knight of Salamnia. Mm-hmm. Um, now the knights were revered before an event called the Cataclysm, which happened in the past of this world. It's based on the world of Kryn. The event. The event. <laughs> yeah. And since then, the knights have fallen into disgrace. Um, and yeah. he's trying to restore the knights to a place of honor because he is probably the most honorable and honor-bound character in this book. If you imagine Worf in fantasy. <laughs> That's the right. kind of person he is. Everything he does, he he's is to try and protect and defend others. He's he's really like when like when Q made them all go to medieval times, yeah. <laughs> and Basically we find out that the Wolf was not a merry man. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's what so I imagine when you say that. <laughs> he's like a very much the stoic okay. character. Right. Um, then other characters are Gold Moon, who's the chieftain's daughter. They encounter. She's not a, a member of the party in the beginning of the story she's an NPC but within the first few uh, you know first few pages practically she's become a member of the group because okay. they're trying to help her but we'll come back to that later Riverwind is Goldwind's com- uh, Goldmoon's companion mm-hmm. he's another member like Goldmoon of the Keishu tribe right um, but he's an, he's been outcast but he's in love with Goldmoon um, Raceland now there's a, a pair of brothers in this Raceland mm-hmm. and Caramon Okay. Raceland is the Marge of the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, Raceland Magier. Now, he is very much the typical Marge trope. Uh, very cliched. He's a, the one thing that is really interesting about the character is that he basically destroyed is uh, destroyed his health doing certain like uh, Marge trials right. in order to attain a certain level of power. Mm. So he's got this incredible power, but matched with an incredibly weak body <laughs> so his brother Caramon is always trying to look out for him, look after him, make sure that you know he's okay and Raceland hates that because he's incredibly intelligent and thinks his brother's a oafish simpleton right. Which in, but he needs saving sometimes <laughs> in some <laughs> ways he him. is kind of quite simple as a character mm. Caramon is uh, Caramon is the warrior um, he's like a the barbarian warrior of the group and um, he is very genial. He's like the exact opposite of Raceland. Right. Um, but he's always there trying to look after Raceland. Okay. Um, and then the rest of the party is made up by Flint Fireforge, mm-hmm. who's a dwarven blacksmith and fighter. Uh, he's Tannis's oldest friend. He's older than the rest of the group. He considers the group to be children, basically. <laughs> but he doesn't like Raceland. Okay. And then there's Tass. Tass will have birth for that. But Tass is a kender. Um, these are kind of like almost not quite dwarfs but d- child sized right? Um, and th- completely immune to fear the Kendas are but just generally goes around emptying everyone else's possessions into his <laughs> uh, but not he wouldn't consider it thieving and would probably consider it be quite upset if you called him <laughs> a thief but um, just everyone else's is. possessions just seem to find their way into his bag, mm. and he's he's the he's like the the guide, the scout. He's got all well, this everyone's collection of maps. Just against him, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the characters that make up the, you know, the the group, and as as you can tell, they're quite. Um, 
quite the fantasy and D&D party kind of tropes. They go around together as a party after a while, do they? Yeah, they well, they, the story starts with them coming together. Now, one of the main themes um, that the writers have, have said in interviews and things of this is the restoration of truth and faith. So when the cataclysm happened, you've got the like the evil gods and the true gods, the gods mm-hmm. of light and darkness uh, right. battling. Then the gods seem to disappear. <laughs> now, five years before we get into the story, uh, the group have all gone off on individual quests of their own, and mm-hmm. they planned and arranged to meet up uh, together at this tavern okay. uh, on this at this particular day with the D twenties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, so they come together, and Tannis was trying to find some sort of sign of of uh, of the gods. Okay, you know, um, yeah. and. What happens here? I don't want to go into spoilers, but they come together and they hear this story. Uh, well, not the story, but they hear rumours of this blue crystal staff and mm-hmm. that these seekers seekers are after it. So, they when they come back to the tavern, the, their hometown has been occupied by the seekers. Right. Uh, anyway, with I don't want to go into any, as I say, spoilers. So, they find out that the find these two uh, barbarian plainsmen and mm-hmm. a plainswoman. Um, one of whom has the blue crystal staff. The, right. So they have to get her out to safety before the Seekers take her. Mm-hmm. So they do that. Then, as the story progresses, they become attacked by Draconians, which are like these reptilian lizard men. Um, then they get pointed off. They have to start going uh, after these discs of Mishakal, which contain the truth about the, the old gods, the true gods. Um, and they basically it's I don't, it's kind of very difficult not to give spoilers about this because there well, are just, so many different strands to this story but it's all one thing leading to another thing and it's, it's if the best way i can think of describing it is if you're on a role playing campaign mm. and each of the little sessions each of the little quests lead into the big quest yeah, it's well, kind of like that. So, like one, that's what they did. one session leads into another session, and then from there to there, and that's mm. very much how the story progresses. But if you don't want to do spoilers. Just tell us the themes. So more. the themes, as we say, are uh, the the characters coming together, forming this really strong tightly knit group, having and sharing. But, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, and we see the one one. I'd say the predominant theme is this restoration of truth and faith. Yeah. So right. Tannis and the others have lost their their faith. They don't believe that the and like everybody else, they don't believe that the the gods are going to return. Um, same with Sturm. He believes that Paladine is 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 gone, uh, but will come back. Mm. Um, and it's you see Tannis as time goes on starts to. He starts to see evidence of true clerics and evidence that you know the gods are going to return. So that really, right. really is there, but it's all overlaid with this D and D party and this quest. So the bigger stuff going on. There apart is bigger from the stuff. Quest. Yeah. So yeah, oh, that's that's interesting. So how many um, how many of these books are there? You say it's a series. It's uh, well. There's the dra- these were actually based on the Dragonlance game modules. So the mm-hmm. uh, the story these books and stories came based on the uh, the game and the established right. world okay. of the game. There were quite a number of Dragonlance books, but these are the specifically the Dragonlance Chronicles. Right. Um, so you've got three, I think four um, all together in the Dragonlance Chronicles. Well, that's quite doable um, for reading. Yeah. This and, and then there's more stories beyond that. Um, but there's also a ca- cartoon adaptation of this, which was uh, made back in 2008. That had oh, Michael. Was it to be made in the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> it had. Well, it was kind of. It felt like it was made in the 80s. <laughs> right. It's kind of like got a mixture of like 2D and 3D animation in the film. Oh, cool. um, Lucy Lawless pl- it does the voice for Gold Moon. Right. Uh, well, yeah, Kiefer she needs to be in a, a fantasy thing. Kiefer <laughs> Sutherland does the p- voice of Raceland. Okay. And Michael Rosenbaum does uh, the voice of Tannis. Right. So quite a, a good voice cast. The mm. film itself isn't great. <laughs> um, but I would say, as uh, with the, when it comes to this story, that I was thinking about whether or not I could really recommend this for people to go out and read. And I thought I was going to do that because when I read this as a kid, I absolutely loved it. Mm-hmm. I read it again a few years later 
and I loved it a little less. <laughs> and oh, you then, hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say I hate this book. Uh, no. Far from it, because it's it's got like a bit of a special place mm-hmm. uh, for me because it was one of the early books of fantasy that I read. Yeah. And I, I re- reading it more recently with the thought of of uh, doing this for Tome Talk. I have to admit that I just it wasn't as good as I remember it. I think I've read too much better fantasy since mm. reading this and yeah. as a result uh, the way I interpret this book has gone down in my estimation so like everything else has got better and yeah. the books stay the same obviously <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I would say that if you like role playing uh, games, particularly mm. D&D, then this is a book that you would probably enjoy and it, I feel like yeah. it's a very good starting point if, uh, when it comes to fantasy for, for kids or even yeah. maybe for adults when it comes to uh, fantasy, you know, rather than jumping into something like The Wheel of Time, which is an epic series and it's my favourite fantasy series, mm. but it's huge. Yeah. This would make a much better starting entry for somebody. Oh, actually, I, I like the idea of this from what you've been saying about it because, like, this kind of thing, like what would happen in a role playing game is mm. part of what fantasy is meant to be, yeah. isn't it? And obviously, years later, they've had to build on that, mm. make things more complicated. But it's nice to read something that's kind of back to the core of what an adventure should be. And like to you, it just seems a bit too basic mm. or something now. But yeah, if someone is just going to start reading a fantasy book... I think, I think the thing is, when I was going back to this, I was seeing all the cliches, all the tired tropes. Yeah. If I was new to reading fantasy books, I wouldn't know these cliches. I wouldn't know the tired tropes. And I think I would enjoy like, it a wow, lot Wow, wizard! <laughs> <laughs> I think it would just be so much better if I'd not been so well read with fantasy. So I think if you are, as a starting place, this is probably going to be quite a good starting place for you to be reading uh, fantasy. If you're a kid, you're going to absolutely love this character. I mean, several people that I knew as kids read this book and we all loved it. Mm. And then we went back to it later years. We all thought, you know, it wasn't actually that great. It's good for their inner child. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, in those situations, you'd probably love it. And as I say, um, it still holds a special place for me. And one of the reasons I actually nearly didn't do this tone talk this time, I was going to, I was thinking about talking about a different book instead. Mm. Um, But I thought, actually, I'd rather talk about this now because then some of those later fantasy books will will be better. Mm. Otherwise, if you read those and then read this one you'd be probably disappointed right okay (laughs) so if you're going to read a lot of fantasy books try and read this one early on um because you might not want to read it later (laughs) (laughs) and if you're a kid read it as well so this is dragons of autumn twilight and that's why who Tracy Weiss and Margaret Hickman. Hey, thanks. No, the front cover's gone. Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. I always good. get those confused. Nice save, though. Nice. Yeah. And good that you realised it. You didn't have to go back and edit later. So <laughs> that is Tone Talk for this week. So thank you for watching. Stay meddlesome. Farewell, Questa. To find out about other productions by the Meddlesome Meeples, then check out our channel or rendezvous with us at meddlesomemeeples.com. Until next time, Quester, farewell, and keep thine axe sharp.